Welcome to Off the Coast, where we examine the views from Vancouver Island with your host, Rosemary Barnes. New and exciting things, preserved and respected things, business, recreation, politics, travel, all from the point of view of the people living and working on the island. Rosemary is a professional speaker and certified speaking coach living in historic Ladysmith and loving every day of the island life. Here is your Vancouver Island host, Rosemary. Good afternoon, morning or evening, depending on where you are to everyone. Welcome to Off the Coast, Views from Vancouver Island. I'm your host, Rosemary Barnes, the maverick voice at Confidence Stages. Today's show is Learning with Living. Learning is Living with Kathy Holmes. Kathy is an amazing woman. She does not have enough time morning till night to breathe because so many people need her. And isn't that a wonderful situation to be in? Five and a half years ago, Kathy decided to make a major life shift after her longtime marriage ended. She decided to buy a sailboat that she didn't know how to sail and set off to build a new life in Nanaimo. It was a move that proved to be the best decision she ever made. Today, Kathy is the program coordinator for Nanaimo Family Life's Better at Home program, which helps seniors stay in their homes longer, and is the director of, the, of her own 25-year-old tutoring company, Right Choice Education Programs. In her spare time, she writes a monthly segment, Tutor Talks or Nanaimo and Voyager magazine, and is a regular radio personality on living for the health of it. I have to say that carefully. Welcome to the show, Kathy Holmes. Hi, how are you today? Fine, thank you. Living for the health of it. <laughs> yes, living for the health of it. Yes, absolutely. It's a fantastic radio program that really is designed to uh, take a look at our everyday existence and try to find ways for us to live better, live healthier, live stronger. And uh, and it's quite uh, quite a well known actual show here in Nanaimo. So it's it's an exciting place to be once a month on the first Tuesday of every month. That's so. Here you are being. So comfortable on radio, you're making me feel nervous now. Oh, please don't. <laughs> not to worry. You're a great host. Oh, bless your heart. It's easy to be a host when you have great guests. Oh, the, uh, Kathy, the, is it true? Now, I've heard this, but I have not verified it for myself, so I thought we may as well chat about it, that sure. for every year that passes, the average human being's life expectancy increases by five years. Have you heard that by five hours? Sorry. For every year that passes, the average human being's life expectancy increases by five hours. Have you ever heard that? I have, Rosemary, but I'm not, you know, I'm not an expert at whether or not there's some truth to that or not. But I certainly know that when you are taking care of yourself and you're creating a quality of life, then there's no question that it will in, it will affect your overall well-being and certainly prolong your life. Um, so I'm not sure whether or not that's true or not, but I think I think that that's probably a statement that's very fair to say. I would love to find out who created that statement and see if it was simply a Facebook statement or whether there's some validity to it. Anyway, so you – now, Kathy, you and I have known each other just a little bit for just a little while, and I can completely see you buying a sailboat even though you don't know how to sail it. Where were you when you bought this sailboat? Well, you know, thank you for that question. It's a great question. Um, I, you know, you, you call yourself the maverick voice uh, for confident stages. I'm probably a maverick after my mother in wanting to always try new things and to give yourself the opportunity to experience the business of living and, and not sit on the sidelines. Um, and it, the good news is, is when you don't know how to do something, regardless of what it is, you're forced to put yourself in the hot seat and actually learn how to do it. Um, so where was I? Well, I had come from a really difficult 
marriage. Um, I had been married for about 10 years and my partner, unfortunately, was uh, quite an abusive gentleman. And I won't go into that on, on the show, but um, but I had to make a decision for myself as to whether or not I was going to stay in this marriage or whether or not I was going to set sail and try to do something different. Um, and so I found myself, you know, actually sleeping in my car for a couple of days. And I had gone, a girlfriend had seen me in the grocery store and she said, you know, darling, you really should come and stay with me. Um, and I said, okay, I think I'll do that because sleeping in your car is not a fun thing to do. And so I went to her place and uh, she had um, the internet up on Craigslist, which I at that time had never used. And so I decided that I would go to Craigslist and I would see, you know, really what was available for me in the way of apartments and things like that. Mm. And what I remembered was when I was in my 20s, I'm certainly not in my 20s any longer, but when I was in my 20s, I had lived on a boat. And I decided that what I wanted to do was find out my authentic self and go back to that space in my life when I felt the most comfortable in my skin, when I felt the happiest, and when I felt the safest, and I re remembered my life on this little, what I call a Barbie boat, that was moored <laughs> in Victoria, and um, and I thought, you know what, forget about looking for an apartment, it's time to go look for a boat. So I came <laughs> I, I, through Craigslist, I was able to find a couple of boats that I thought looked okay and were worth my time, and so I jumped into my car and I came over to Nanaimo and I had a look at them. And my boat is called Comfortably Numb. Oh. As soon as I stepped on her, I knew it was my boat. And so I basically went back to Vancouver, signed up the papers, and I said, okay, this is it. This is what I'm going to do. Life has a way of unfolding sometimes in a way that we least expected. And what I had found myself doing was coming back and forth because I had not yet left my, my former life, I was still in this transition space and trying to work it out as well in, in all truth, right? So I went mm -hmm. home and I started coming across to Nanaimo every weekend and every weekend was bliss. And so I found that it was imperative for me to actually take my life by the horn and decide to make a leap and a bold leap uh, to a place where I didn't really know very many people. I didn't know a few people, uh, but I didn't know many and um, just see whether or not it was, uh, was something I was able to do and to start again. And so I did. I packed up my old kid bag, jumped across uh, uh, the ferry and I lived on my boat for the first couple of weeks I was here. And realized, of course, that since I didn't know how to sail it, that that would be my first step. So <laughs> I, I, I enrolled in a, um, in a power squadron program. Uh, I started to learn the important parts of the boat. Uh, I started to learn how to navigate so that if I did get it out of the water, out into the water, that I would be able to actually go somewhere and return again. Um, <laughs> And I decided that that wasn't enough. Safety, of course, is of utmost importance. And so I needed to learn on my radio how to call uh, for an emergency. So I got my radio license for the boat. And within a short period of time, I was sailing. The good news was that the person that I purchased the boat from and I had become great friends and very quickly. And so he had a sister ship uh, in Florida. And I decided, well, what better way to learn how to sail than to go to the Florida Keys, one of the most beautiful places in the world, and sail from, from uh, Key West to the Dry Tortugas, which is an amazing adventure in itself. Wow. So I went down for 10 days, and I ended up staying for 20. <laughs> when I went down, his boat is a Pioneer, and Pioneer boats are they're just such lovely boats and very similar to mine. But his is on tiller and mine is on wheel. When you're sailing on tiller, every direction is the opposite. So if you want to go left with the boat, then you have to take your tiller and turn it right. If you want to turn it, you know, if you want to go right, then you have to turn the tiller left. Oh, and so forth. no. So oh, it, no. <laughs> getting used to that was really quite the challenge. But before you knew it, I was sailing the seas and really, you know, enjoying beautiful flying fish and manta rays and, you know, mm. everything that you can imagine in the brightest, most beautiful waters I think oh. uh, that I had ever been to for sure. 
Wow. So that must have been incredible. I, it was, Rosemary. It was so incredible. Um, and it really gave me strength. It, it gave me confidence again. It gave me a sense of accomplishment. It was just me and my friend, uh, Ted down there. Uh, and we were not together. We were just good friends. And so, you know, he and I were able to create this incredibly good relationship where he could sleep for three hours and I would sail for three hours or he, I would sleep for three hours and he would sail for three hours. So I really had to learn those skills because you're in the middle of the ocean and land is very far away. And mm. so you just basically learn how to do it or you don't. And so when I came home, I thought to myself, I can sail. Yahoo! Very big mistake. Uh-oh. What did, what, oh, no. What happened? Well, I called my best girlfriends and I said, okay, gals, it's time to get on the boat. We're rocking. We're going to do a little crab fishing. We're going to take the boat out. We're going to take her on her inaugural sail. And because I was on wheel, I was unfamiliar with the uh, the way that you get out of the marina because Uh-oh. it just it wasn't such an easy task as I had thought. So uh, have you ever seen the show Austin Powers, Rosemary? Yes. So if you ever, to our listeners, if you haven't had a chance to see the first Austin Powers, I, it's, a, it's an old movie now, but it's definitely worth watching. There's a segment in the movie where the... Um, where where Austin is trying to catch the bad guy and he's in a little truck in a hallway. And so he goes a half an inch forward and a half an inch back and a half an inch forward and a half, but he doesn't get anywhere. He just stays stuck between these two hallways. (laughs) Well, that was me getting out of my Marina. Oh no. (laughs) So of course my girlfriends are all freaking out because they had no idea how to sail. And Captain Kathy is, was in charge. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> it, it was quite the sight and, and very, you know, it, going looking back on it now, it was it was one of the most terrifying, difficult, upsetting, you know, situations that I ever dealt with. Happily, I had uh, created great relationships with some of the people on the marina and they were able to get me back to dock safe and sound for which we did have crab. So while I was crying and blubbering and my friends were laughing, uh, we we made crab and had a crab fest on the on the end of the boat. So well, it was a, it did work out fun. After I, I now had the boat for six years and I can sail it quite well at this point. So all is good. <laughs> all is do good. You, do you still get out on the boat? Um, you're not still living on the boat. No, no. I bought a house okay. in Nanaimo, yeah, a few months after that. So, uh, yeah, no, I'm I'm quite settled here. My boat is currently docked in my driveway. I wish it wasn't. Um, but Thank at the you. last sale last year, I noticed that the mast was just a little on the wobbly side. And due to the fact that the job that I'm in right now takes an extensive amount of my time and marinas are very expensive to stay in, I felt it was a good idea to bring the boat home and do a full refit. So I'm in the process right now of redoing the floors, redoing the cabin, uh, fixing the mast, uh, tweaking it, giving it a pretty paint job, and hopefully I will be back on the water by the end of this season. Is it true that a boat is a money pit? It is. Yeah, you don't go out Rosemary without there being, you know, a hundred bucks, two hundred bucks, a thousand bucks, a fifteen hundred. So it can be very expensive. It is a money pit, yeah, but it's worth it. And I I say that for a couple of reasons. First of all, there's nothing better than being on the open water with your sails in butterfly mode, meaning that your the sails are full, your jib is full, your mast is full, and you're open, and you're just going two or three ni- uh, uh, knots in the bright sunshine and enjoying a corona in the process. Oh, wow. It sounds Very like peaceful. heaven on earth. And because my boat's called Comfortably Numb, which is a, a made famous, of course, by, um, by oh, my goodness. Um, what's that band? Oh I don't my know. Goodness. It, it'll come to us in a blazing blurt to- of clarity, yes. It will, it will, but uh, a very famous band, anyway, and my one of my favorite bands. And to have that really blaring in the background, full blast, and just really enjoying mm. You know, the beautiful earth that we're on. I mean, it doesn't get any better than that. So you found a safe place. I did. I found a place and I found myself, right? I I really did. I found that I was stronger than I thought I was. Uh, Mm. I was more 
capable of making decisions because I had been, for lack of better words, stummed. In other words, uh, you know, I wasn't able to to have clarity in my decisions because I was in such a difficult relationship and my voice was, you know, stepped on. So, um, and and it, it, I found that once I was able to gain my power back, I was then able to take on much more challenging tasks. You know, I'm not, this sounds, I'm not, a lot of people who are in abusive relationships, Rosemary, they're there and they don't even understand why they're there. There's a tremendous amount of incredibly intelligent women who are well-educated, who have great jobs and who are doing things, but they have a real difficulty with power at home where the, the husband at times can be overbearing or dominant or, and you're not really allowed to have a life of your own. And Mm -hmm. so a lot of women who are in that situation don't realize that they're in it. And so for me, I really had to come to terms with the fact that I could make my own decisions and that I was capable of some really wonderful things um, rather than just being, you know, pushed down, um, down in such in such a way that, you know, I, I was in shock, Rosemary, that I was even in an abusive relationship. I didn't believe that I was in an abusive relationship. And so it, when I realized I, I was, um, and, it, you know, it, it was a pretty easy to figure out. He was kicking down doors and breaking windows and doing, you know, oh, my goodness, stuff. it was really bad. Um, and I just kept looking at my life going, why am I here? What am I doing? But mm-hmm. I was very much in love with my husband. And so it took a really long time for me to to extricate myself from that situation. And then from there to bloom, to go from being, sure. you know, really having a hard time to having the, the good successes I think that I have today. And to, and to know that it's okay to smile and be happy. And, and it's more than okay to smile and be happy. It is, in fact, our responsibility as individuals to be responsible for our own happiness and to have the courage to to step outside and color outside of those lines and just really see what you're made of. And there, yeah, people fall for sure. We all do. But to, to be able to pick yourself up, brush yourself up, start again and do it with with the concept knowing that you can give to a community and that is where I find myself now is really expanding my world into the community, sharing the, the situation that I've been in, in the hopes that other people will be able to see something inside of themselves, that little glimmer inside of themselves that says, wait a minute, I, I am me and I'm cool and I'm good and I can walk ahead and do well for others. Is that how you got involved with Nanaimo Family Life? It is. Uh, how I got involved with Nanaimo Family Life Association was I, I began doing their workshops. The workshops were about self-confidence and self-esteem. They were about um, time management. They were about grief. They were about, there were several different workshops. And when I first came over to The Rock, what I needed to do was <laughs> put myself back together again because I was a bit on the fragile side, right? And so I started thinking, well, you can't do anything externally. It all has to come from within. So go get the help to find out what's within. So I started going to the workshops. And while going to the workshops, uh, Mia Goodall, who's our amazing woman, and she's our volunteer coordinator, she said to me, you know, if you're interested in becoming a counselor, she said, you know, I invite you to go up to the university and take these a couple of courses and then come back to NFLA and do the training. So I jumped on that like right away. And timing being what it was, the course was starting like a week after she said it. So ultimately it was meant to be. So I went through the program. I became a, a counselor for Nanaimo Family Life Association. I then... um was really enjoying that process. I was still teaching pretty much full time. Um, well, well, wait, and, we haven't covered that part. Oh, teaching where? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Just teaching ahead of where? Time. Hang on, lady. Okay, we'll come back to that in a minute. So, um, so once I started finished doing the counseling program, and I and I had done that, uh, the position for program coordinator for a very new program, which is now a couple of years old, uh, that is sponsored by the United Way, came up. 
and uh, I interviewed against I don't even know how many people, but there were a lot. And uh, I, I was I was fortunate enough to acquire the position. So now I'm the program coordinator for Nanaimo Family Life Association, and I work with seniors every day. So it's a really great opportunity. Oh, my goodness. Okay, now, so you're teaching full-time, and we're working. Work- yeah, 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 yeah. So well, at the time, okay, yeah. how long was it, uh, just to make sure my timeline in my own brain is working here, how yeah. long was it between the time you made your move to Vancouver Island, the rock, and, okay, then you, 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 you were out on the boat, and you were learning to sail, and you sailed in Florida, you came back, and, and you bought a house and whatnot. All right, so all this time, are you teaching? Yes, except, okay. and, except for the time that I was in Florida, which was only for 20 days, right? So it wasn't right. a long period of time, right? So uh, I, was, I was building teacher. my practice here. I was building my practice here. I own a company and have for 25 years called Right Choice Educational Programs. I specialize in the English 12 provincial exams and high school English going from grade 8 through 12. I also specialize in ESL and helping students from from uh, all over the world, actually, to pass the IELTS exam, the TOEFL exam, or any of the entrance level exams into any university in Canada that have to do with the English language. So that, that's been a specialty of mine for to, over 25 years now. And while I certainly did teach full time, I don't any longer. I now teach about eight or nine classes a week, uh, along with working full time at the Better at Home program and the other things that I'm doing on the side. Um, now, what your classes, uh, because apparently we have segued now into the the <laughs> your tutoring business, right? Which which is uh, right choice education programming. Yeah. All right. So right, when you right have educational programs, yeah. Ed, right choice educational programs. Okay. Have we said that enough times yet? I have don't. We, think. We, <laughs> we could say that one more time. One more time. So your company is called Right Choice Educational Programs. Is that right? That's right. <laughs> okay. I think we've I think we've milked that enough. So, so when you say you're teaching classes, do you have uh, multiple people in your classes, or is it one or one, or is it a combination of the of the two? The Tell us about the that. Two. Yeah, okay. it's a combination of the two. Um, for the most part, I work on one-on-one, and I work in people's homes uh, as a tutor in doing that. Um, but I've also taught many classes that there are multiple uh, students in the class, sometimes up to 30 students at a time. Uh, traditionally, however, my preference is to work with a smaller classroom size, usually between 10 and 14 is a great number. Um, but more often than not, at this stage of my life, Rosemary, I'm doing private one-on-one evening classes in different people's homes within our community. I also do Skype and I do online classes. So, you know, there's always that opportunity for someone who's really in need of having some extra services. But for the most part, my primary focus is with Nanaimo Family Life. Uh, it takes a tremendous amount of my time to work with the over 400 seniors that we have in the community. Uh, Mm -hmm. We have many more seniors, but seniors that we're directly working with uh, through the Better at Home program. And so, you know, teaching is is still very important in my life. Um, I don't think I will ever give it up. It's a passion that I've always enjoyed. And it's really a rich experience to see someone who goes from not being able to speak the language at all to having fluency. And is, to be able to yes. write some of the tougher exams. So, you know, there's a lot of a lot of students that have benefited from the service for sure. At this I, time, yeah. at this time, however, my focus has really been on the more media side of things. You know, um, working with the seniors, speaking in front of large crowds about the United Way, about the services we offer at Nanaimo Family Life. Um, I do a lot of one-on-one work with seniors. Uh, I do a lot of training of volunteers, uh, contractors. Uh, I do pro- some proposal writing, depending on what it's for. Uh, so there's a it's a much broader job description now. And really, there's not that much of a difference between teaching uh, and serving. They're no. all about, it, it's all really about, about understanding where a person is at and taking them from where they're at to where they want to go. 
that's exactly the mandate. I don't know if you know that I also am a certified teacher as well. And you're I dead know on. That, yes. Yes. And so that's exactly right. Good teachers know that no matter how many students they have, and boy, that makes it difficult when you've got integrated classes of 30 plus students all coming from different backgrounds, you, the, the, your mandate is to take every single student from where they are and get them further along. Yeah, absolutely. And it's a gift. It's not a gift uh, in the sense that it's a gift to be able to do that, although I suppose it is. It's a gift to be able to watch a person lighten, right? To yes. Go from being really unsure about where they're, you know, where they are and to watch them bloom like a precious flower. It, it's a very rich experience. It, it truly is. It truly is, Kathy. There is nothing like, as you say, uh, also having taught ESL or as it's called in Alberta at any rate, ELL, because oh, yeah. in, e- English is not only is sometimes not the second language, it's the fifth or sixth. Uh, yes. But but to be able to communicate well, I wish, and this is my own private little tantrum here, I wish that our own people would learn to speak the language as well as some of our newcomers to our country. <laughs> well, the, you know, and I agree with you. Uh, you know, when you if you take a look at the IELTS test, I don't know, Rosemary, if you've had much ex, um, experience with the IELTS test, but if you if you have if you haven't, I invite you to take a look at it. It's a tough test, and, yes. and really strength of that exam, uh, you know, you really have to be incredibly literate and understand vocabulary to the fullest extent in order to be able to really do a good job on the IELTS test. And for those of you who are listening around the world, which I know that, you know, you could be coming from any part of this grand uh, planet that we live on, it's incumbent upon you to really try to get a stronger command of the English language. And you can do that in so many ways. YouTube has some incredible uh, videos for the IELTS exam. Uh, My website, of course, has a lot of information that you're welcome to click on. There's no charge to be on on the website. Um, And you can find information just by researching. But the IELTS test is is a really solid test. And and the first time I took it, by the way, and I've been teaching for, like I said, 25 years, probably, you know, close to 28 or 29 years in education as a whole, working for different colleges and universities uh, in Vancouver. And and what I found was I failed the first time. Isn't that incredible? And I English is your time. native language. And it's my native language. So now part of it was because I was a little cocky and I thought, well, you know, just take the exam, you'll do fine. Uh, I didn't really read the questions as I should have. So, Mm. you know, one of the experiences that I have as a teacher today and always is that you have to, you know, really be in the shoes of your students and again, meet them where they're at, but be in the shoes of where the students are and recognize your own learning curves. You know, what is it that, that, that you really need to grow on? so that you can explore that with your student and remember what it's like to be a learner because being a teacher and being a learner are the same. We're learning from our students more than we're ever teaching them. There is a, there is a, a, a belief that in order to find out if you actually know something well, try teaching it to someone else. It's true. Yeah, it's absolutely true. To be able to answer all the questions that may come up from another point of view. So... And I love that you are now able to take that attitude of teaching is learning and learning is teaching and and combine the two and be able to help our very vibrant senior population here. The yes, yes, it's uh, there are these people are go ahead fifty thousand. Yeah, we have 15,837 seniors over the age of 65 that live in the city of Nanaimo. That doesn't include our outskirt communities. Like, you know, we have several outskirt communities, much like Vancouver does. Vancouver is a pretty small core. And then, you know, there's Surrey and Ladner and Delta and all that. But our core city, we have 15,837, of which 8,307 are below the poverty line or living on basic pension. So there's a lot of people here that are vibrant, and there's a lot of people here as well that are in terrible need. Uh, You know, we take a lot of people to the food bank. 
We take a lot of people for medical appointments that are gravely ill, and yet we have a much larger proportion, as much as we have that as a, as a significant proportion, we have a much larger proportion of people in their 70s, 80s, and 90s that are full-spirited and are really active in our community, doing any number of volunteer opportunities and, and really contributing greatly to, the, to our society as a whole. There is something that I heard that aging is a process of losing things. And so first you lose uh, your agility or your muscle power or uh, your memory. And it's by the time it comes down to losing your home and your possessions, you feel like you've lost so much. So being able to help people stay where they have their own things seems to me you know, provided they've got the medical care and the and the, the ability to get places, do places, enjoy their life, how much nicer to sit in your own couch that you've sat in for a few years and the bum print is just right and then to have to move somewhere that isn't home. Well, you know, I think that I love your statement. It's a process of losing, losing things. And I'd like to reframe that if you don't mind. Sure. Um, for almost from the moment we're born, uh, we're in a grieving process. And I think that, that, you know, there are lots of things right from the time that we're born that we are, that we are grieving. For example, when we're toddlers, uh, we're grieving the need for the closeness with our mommies. When we are in grade seven, we're grieving elementary school. When we're in grade 12, we're grieving the simplicity of high school. When we're finished university, then we're grieving that whole simplicity, which, you know, is, it's always about the yesteryear, right? It's always about the yesteryear. So if, if we can get a handle, and I think that a lot of the elders that I work with that are in their 90s have a real handle on the grieving process, understanding that everything has a season, and everything in that season happens on time at the right time. And so while there are parts of us that lose things that we're not ready for, for example, in elders, the biggest one, the capacity to drive, when driver's oh. license are taken away, that is a huge transitional period. Yes. But what it does do is as we close that door for driving and we grieve that door for driving, we're opening the new door for allowing those people that have been in our lives, instrumental in our lives, and sometimes strangers, to come in and serve and help us to go to the next transitional phase. And so... So, yes, yes, it's a part process of losing. It's also a process of gaining. We're gaining as we grow older wisdom. We're gaining as we grow older skills. We're gaining as we grow older patience, compassion, empathy, or our true self, which sometimes can be bitter and angry and frustrating. And so what we have to do as our, as our job of being individuals is to be able to accept who we are from right, right where we are, much like in teaching and much like in other areas of our life, accept our station and see how we can challenge ourselves to become better, more, um, to accept, to understand, and to, to, what happens for a lot of elders is that they get stuck in that mousetrap of, uh, you know, I can't walk anymore, I can't do this anymore, I can't do anything, and they forget about what they can do, right? Mm. They, you know, and, and to be able to separate those two things and realize that life, you know, for as long as we're on this planet, uh, and for whatever your beliefs around the world may be about either an afterlife or no afterlife or whatever it might be to you, and that's an individual thing for everyone, um, you know, once you get to this place where you can accept whatever time you have here, your job is to make the best of it. And if that means inviting people in to learn how to be with other people, that's a great thing. I find that a lot of the contractors that I have going into the homes are learning much more from the elders. They're having the opportunity to understand things like dementia and Alzheimer's disease, which are prevalent among seniors uh, in our population. They're learning how to deal with their own understanding of strengths and weaknesses. You know, when you walk into uh, a woman's home, 
or a man's home and they're on oxygen, which is very common. Yes. Uh, it, you know, you really have to ask yourself, it, it, t- it almost teaches you that, you know, to take care of yourself, to, to respect your body even more than you ever did before. Um, you know, if you're going into a hoarding situation, it's teaching about empathy and non-judgmental behavior because everybody has a right to live as they choose here on this earth. And so when you've got people that have this abundance of stuff, it gives the caregiver an opportunity to say, what, what has happened in this person's life to put them in this position? So I find that the aged really teach, really teach everyone in our community how to be better people of course they do it's, it there are it, for time immemorial the elders have always been the source of wisdom and understanding and insight that youth cannot have yet simply by virtue of the amount of time that they've spent learning that's right Absolutely. Everyone's journey is so different, but for the for the people who have been on this planet a little while longer, they've got a, a, a such a gracious understanding. Now, some elderly people are angry, and some are befuddled and like your boat, a little numb. But once you scratch the surface and find out. What has happened in their lengthy lives, it, it teaches such lessons that should be shared. It, it, Absolutely. it worried me something terrible when I was teaching in a school with grades 7, 8, and 9 students to discover that so many of them, by virtue of the fact that they, uh, lack of exposure, they didn't have grandparents, they yeah. were actually afraid of people that were a little long in the tooth they they i they were trying to make money and i said you know this was in edmonton where snow was abundant for a lot of the year i said how about shoveling snows snow for the elderly oh i don't want to do that they scare me yeah yeah and i'm thinking oh you poor thing it is so wonderful to have elderly people in our lives well, Rosemary, we're trying to remedy that here in Nanaimo, actually. Um, you know, one of the one of our best programs through the Better at Home program is when we bring youth volunteers together with the elders, because you're quite right. There's a large number of of people in our community that that for whatever reason are void of family. Uh, there are a lot of people that their grandparents have passed on, you know, way earlier in life. Um, and so they haven't had the exposure. They haven't had the experience to, to be with, um, to be with elders, uh, you know, and there's other parts in the world where, where the elder is revered and, and treated with great respect and the utmost of, of consistency within the family to support and to ensure that the elder is doing okay. We don't have that in Canada, unfortunately. I wish that we did, but we don't. Some families certainly do, but, but I, you know, of the over 400 people that I serve here, uh, you know, I would say that 75 or 85 percent uh, of the families are nowhere to be found, which is a shame. You know, yes. having said that, I'm dealing with a very specific demographic. You know, there's a lot of ambulatory people. There's a lot of healthy people that are in that 15,000 that don't require any services and have very vibrant family lives. Many of the people I'm dealing with, however, don't. And so it's those people that we need to, you know, as a community, remind our elders that they matter. And it's the focus of the Better at Home program to do just that. At yes. every opportunity, we try to make sure that an elder in our community feels as though they matter. And that, I think, is the greatest strength that we have in the program itself. The, how can you ever find a more worthy cause? You know, there are, there are some very worthy causes. And, and I happen to believe that taking care of children and helping them uh, get a good start on life and taking care of our elders uh, are equally important, not to mention all the people in the middle. But uh, everybody, there, there's a lot of need, Rosemary. I think that we have a that as a human being, we again, it's a season, right? 
we, there are times when we really need the help and there are times when, you know, we can be on our own and have the ability to help others. And so, you know, there, there's a lot of, you know, there's cancer agencies, kidney dialysis, you know, Alzheimer's. Um, and there, those are things that are happening in youth as well as in seniorhood. So yes. it's, it's, it doesn't, it doesn't really matter as a human. Uh, I think that our responsibility is to really get to know who our neighbors are. Uh, I think it's important that we try to place the focus on the things we can do versus the things we can't do, whether it be out of fear or otherwise. Um, and I think that it's really incumbent as well upon the community as a whole to reach into the pockets where there's incredible need, whether it's with seniors or teenagers or, you know, the, 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 the causes are endless. So, but it's within the communities, you know, to, to find that thing that you're passionate about, find that thing that you love and, and work towards contributing to that. Even if you're contributing an hour of your time as a volunteer or to read up on it on the internet or to ask someone at the school if there's a parent that could use some extra support or if you go to the hospital and ask somebody if there's someone on the ward that would require some extra assistance, it's incumbent upon all of us to give. For what we give, we shall receive. Maybe not by the same person, maybe not by, you know, anything more than the act itself, but in doing so, we create that world that we want so desperately, and that is a unified a uh, place where everyone on the earth matters, regardless of their beliefs, regardless of their age, regardless of their disposition, uh, because from all of those people, we learn so much. My favorite thing to do, Rosemary, is to listen to other people's stories, because Isn't I learn great? from them, right? It's just the best part. It's, it, and really listen, not make judgment, just not listen. Make judgment. Yeah, exactly. Just, just listen. Just be. When I was a uh, hundred thousand years ago, when I was young, I was working as a freelance writer, and I had the wonderful opportunity of interviewing all the small, small businesses along the Avenue of Nations in Edmonton. Oh, how Sitting exciting! To, oh, it was so wonderful to to sit down with some of these people and find out how they came from from uh, Korea and Vietnam and Germany and Poland and uh, Italy and sit down with them and realize that they came to Canada with nothing in their pocket but hope. Absolutely. Absolutely. Our, our rock is full of people that have immigrated to Canada and chosen this beautiful place to begin again. And, I'm a testament to that. Even though I came from the Lower Mainland, I'm still a testament to that. Vancouver Island is rich with opportunity. And, um, you know, the, the way that people react to each other, the kindness. There's, did you know, Rosemary, that there's more volunteers per capita in Nanaimo than there is anywhere else in British Columbia? I did not know that. And that, and indeed, not only that, that there is also, that's on the whole island, by the way, that's not Nanaimo specifically, that's the whole island. Um, and that, um, as well, there's more educational opportunities on Vancouver Island than there is in British Columbia. Wow. Yes, because everywhere you go in Nanaimo, even if you don't know the community very well, because uh, I know that was it for me, that there's all kinds of mom and pop shops that have seminars. There's all kinds of workshops that very often in our magazine, both you and I write for the, the Nanaimo Voyager magazine, Rosemary. And so, you know, in our magazine itself on the back couple of pages, uh, which you can find, by the way, if you're visiting, uh, and I welcome you to do this, if you're taking a ferry, a BC ferry over from the mainland or anywhere in British Columbia or anywhere on this island to Nanaimo or anywhere of our ferries in that route segment, you will find Nanaimo Voyager magazine. You may find it under the Voyager cover Instead of Nanaimo magazine, if you're in the city limits of Nanaimo, you'd have the Nanaimo cover. But at the back two pages are a lot of seminars and workshops that, we're, that are going on every day. Um, we do have an, a, a, a community that thrives on a bit of underground, right? We have an underground education. We have yes, underground we music. You know, you can't go anywhere Monday through Sunday and there's somebody's got some music somewhere. So it's yes. really a vibrant town, but it does take time. 
to get to know the people in the community and to part when and how you get to know people of course is by volunteering and, and getting out there but you know once you get in you start to really get to feel the vibrancy of this town and um and we really do a lot of great work uh throughout the community we have a lot of people uh you know that that do everything right they they're involved in more than one uh, like myself, more than one thing. Uh, and that really, as long as you're exploring that way, there's so much that you can learn from doing that. It's a body in motion tends to stay in motion. A body at exactly. rest tends to stay at rest. And exactly. there are a great many of us who have our fingers in multiple pies and, and enjoying, you have and enjoying it. Tons of pies. You betcha. Oh. Yep. Well, and oh, why would we not? We only have one life to live. Exactly. The, so you cover the gamut of uh, teaching mm-hmm. I- individually and in groups yeah. in helping people understand the value of good, solid verbal skills. Very important. Absolutely. Does that include writing skills? It does. Uh, you know, I think that unfortunately... As you know, Rosemary, education has changed. Um, you know, yes. I know, I remember a time when it was a pen and pad and you wrote everything down. There was no such thing as the iPad and the computer for uh, typing out assignments. One of the things that I really find of value and for anyone around the world that's listening that is determined to stay uh, current Please don't let the skill of writing go. Handwriting, cursive writing, and writing short story, writing, you know, paragraphs, writing diaries, writing journals, anything that you're doing to keep that pen to paper. There's a a really important uh, study that was done at Harvard University several years back. And what they talked about was how we cognitively learn. And what they say is that you need to have at least three modalities in motion in order to retain the information. So for those of you that are listening, when you're writing, you're using your modality through your hand, okay? And you're writing, when you're writing, for example, let's use a name, okay? Let's say Rosemary, okay? So the name we're going to write today is Rosemary. You take your pen to pad and you're writing the word in your mind. R-O-S-E-M-A-R-I-E. I hope I spelled that right. You Rosemary. did, bravo. Okay. Um, but you're, when you're writing it cursively, you don't divide the letters. So the word stays in the brain and it retains itself. When you're learning by typing only, you are not using that modality because you're using individual fingers R and then you're pressing a key R O S E M A R I E, but you're not saying that word necessarily in your mind. And so you're using only one modality in that regard. So the idea with cursive writing is to be able to use the word. You see the word as you're writing it because you're seeing it in your imagination and on paper. You're seeing, you're feeling it through your hand. There's your other modality. You've got touch. You've got your sense of brain. You've got that, that communication there. And then on top of that, you are seeing the completion of the word. Whereas when you're typing, you don't unless you force the eye to go back. So right. Harvard University says you keep that information. You retain the information longer by using at least three modalities. Modalities, of course, are hearing, sight, sound, right? Taste and touch. Sure. The tactile learners, the auditory learners, all those learning styles. Yeah. All the different learning styles, but the, but the way to retain the words are by physically writing them out as opposed to typing them. So I found that we've had a lot of success with our students because I won't let them use the computer, of course, unless they're on Skype or something like that, where I have no choice. But, but when I'm doing a one-on-one or a classroom environment, no computers allowed. (laughs) <laughs> and what is the pushback from your students on that? Well, some of them love it and some of them don't. Uh, the ones that love it are the ones that do incredibly well on their grades. Uh, you know, the average provincial exam score for English provincial exam is about 52 to 57% across the oh, board. Oh, that's brutal. Our, 
I know it's terrible. Our students are getting between, you know, anyone that goes through right choice is getting anywhere at the lowest to 78% and usually in the upwards of the high 80s and, and 90s. And the reason it's different is in the classroom, we accommodate for the learning curves. Uh, in a classroom, we are, we are actually you know, we're watching how a person behaves, we're watching about attendance, we're watching about, um, you know, all the variables of how much of growth that that student has done in order to be able to go on to the next level. And so we become attached to the student individually, and we can see their growth. On the provincial exam, in grade 12 anyway, on the IELTS test, on the TOEFL exam, it's a body that does not generally know it's a marker that doesn't know mm -hmm. the personality. And so it's it's not subjective in the same way. It's clinical. Yes. So on a provincial exam, I am looking for this, 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 and this. If they're not there, you're not getting the mark. Correct. Right? In the classroom, you may not have this, 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 but because you're doing this, 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 and that, I'm going to pass you. Yes. So it's a very different way of marking and therefore a different expectation when you're in the learning curve. And and thus the beauty of this turns my my brain into the difference between uh, a webinar versus live coaching or a live performance versus a recorded performance. Yes. There is such a difference when human contact is real and in front of you and happening now. And I also think, and again, it doesn't matter how old you are. I think that I've got 92 year olds, 93 year olds that are learning every day, you know, oh, that take the time to study that are, are whether or not they're learning how to do cross stitch or they're learning how to do, uh, you know, a new yoga pose or they're learning how to, um, how to do a task they've never done before, whatever that might look like. Mm -hmm. uh, doesn't change over the years and as long as we're choosing to learn something small every day we are progressing forward it's when we give up right the the, task is when to we, give up and we give up yeah when we stop learning uh th there's another pithy saying i seem to have a lot of them today I seem to be full of it today there's <laughs> another saying that says when i'm green i'm growing yes when i'm already ripe i'm just rotting Yes. Yeah, it's true. So it, it this this world that we live in has so many wonders. How can you ever learn them all? Yeah, it's not possible. How can you how can you possibly ever say that you're an expert on anything? Yes. As soon as you've learned it, there's something new. To to pose as an expert is to put yourself up there to be knocked off your own pedestal. So, and therein lies the beauty of some of our, some of our elders. Because yeah. we have elders that grew up uh, when cars were still land yachts. Yes. And now they're Skyping. Oh my gosh. Uh, you'd be surprised how many of my, uh, clients are internet dependent. It's fantastic. I'm so excited. <laughs> I am. I mean, while while I don't like my kids to to write using the computer, I encourage kids and of all ages. By the way, you can be 92 and be my kid, as far as I'm concerned. It may be, you know, some people may not appreciate that, but that's okay. Um, you know, it, the way I see it, you know, because we're, we're all kids. I'm a kid too. So yep. the, way, the way I look at it is, you know, if they're engaging in the computer, I think that's a marvelous thing. Um, you know, one of my favorite things to do, and I would invite anybody, anybody on the planet, if you get a chance to do it, it's a hoot. If say you want to travel, here's a good example. You want to travel, but you can't because you may be on oxygen or in a wheelchair or you might not have the capacity or the money or whatever to be able to go somewhere else. But you have access to a computer. You need Google Earth. So on Google Earth, I'm a couch traveler. Whenever mm -hmm. I feel like I need to get away on a vacation, but I am unable to, either because of obligations, restrictions, whatever, I can go to Google Earth and decide to go to Greece, to Mazatlan, to the French Riviera, to M Minnesota, to Seattle, anywhere I want to go. I can go to Google Earth, zoom in, and I can walk the streets of Google Earth. 
It's fantastic. It's a great way to see the world, even if you physically can't do it. If you are online and you're able to get onto the computer for Google Earth, you can go anywhere. That's what I used to say about reading a book. Oh, books that's what I saying. that's what I taught my children is is it doesn't matter if you're in a hospital bed no, in uh, uh, or if you're so poor as long as you can go to the library and get a yeah. book then you can take a vacation without leaving your chair. That's so true. Absolutely. And my, one of my favorite things to do is to sit back and just to read something mindless and fabulous. <laughs> There's so much you can learn. It's grand, absolutely grand. The the essence of of living is to me to be learning, which is why learning is living is the perfect title for today's show. Because if you, how dare anyone say that they've learned everything there is to learn? Oh my goodness, the, no! Yeah, can you imagine? Can. Can you just imagine for a moment saying, that's it, I'm done? I, and you know what? I get that. Uh, I really do. I think that, that one of the things that I've learned about myself in the last five and a half years, particularly, is that I'm a work in progress. Um, I'm in my 50s. I feel very comfortable that I know squat. I love the idea that I get to learn something again tomorrow and this afternoon and in the next 15 minutes. Uh, and I recognize that the power that we have, the the hope that we have to have a quality of life, no matter what your station is, is to be able to go inside and ask yourself the, the most important question. And that is, what inspires me? And when you figure out what inspires you and you start reaching towards that inspiration, that's when all those things start to unfold and we get to a place where we're really, really comfortable in our skin and can learn that much more because now we're open. Now we're open. So I invite you, if you're listening around the world and you have gone through some of the things I've gone through, I invite you really to ask yourself that question. What makes me tick? And go and find it. But just to close up our show, you deliberately chose Vancouver Island. And I did. What inspires you? today about Vancouver Island? I think the thing that inspires me the most today, especially on Vancouver Island, is the, the concept that I have just begun, even though I've been here now five and a half years, uh, I have just begun to touch the foundation of our community. And it's my hope that I will touch the foundation of this community for many, many more years to come. And that in itself inspires me. I get to meet some of the most phenomenal people on the planet. I believe they are anyway, because I, I get to bear witness to their stories. And in bearing witness to their stories, I'm growing my own story. And so I feel that the inspiration for me is the people that I work with, uh, you know, the people at the magazine, the people at Nanaimo Family Life, the people that I get to meet every day that are volunteers giving up of their time. Those are the things that inspire me today. And I look forward to a long, long journey on this wonderful place, uh, this wonderful rock uh, and, and hope I can do a lot more to make things uh, even better here for as long Kathy, as I can. You are an inspiration to so many people here, and I thank you for being on our show today and sharing your wisdom and your learning with the whole big wide world. Thank you, Kathy, for being on the show. Thanks, Rosemary. It was a pleasure to be here. That is Kathy Holmes of the Nanaimo Family Life Center, the Better at Home program, Right Choice Educational programs. She's she's a writer with Nanaimo and Voyager magazine and a radio personality on Living for the Health of It. It's been an honor to speak with Kathy today. Next week is the 29th of March, and because Off the Coast Views from Vancouver Island is a 
four-week-in-a-month show. There will be no show next week, but rest assured, we will be back on April the 6th with a wonderful guest named Nicole Natras. Nicole is about theater as well as journaling, and uh, she's an instructor, and she's a writer, and she's a story coach, and she's here, she's going to be here sharing with us on the 6th of April. So until then, have a wonderful Easter. I'm looking forward to uh, my grandchildren are coming for the Easter break, and I'm a happy, happy woman. So until next time, this is Rosemary Barnes the Maverick Voice at Confident Stages, and your host of Off the Coast, Views from Vancouver Island, wishing you a wonderful Easter, a great break, and we'll speak to you again in April. Bye-bye. Thank you for listening to Off the Coast, Views from Vancouver Island, with host Rosemary Barnes. To book Rosemary as a speaker or speaking coach, or to offer suggestions of extraordinary guests for the show, please visit her website at www.confidentstages.com.